Well, hello everybody, and welcome to this, our very first episode of Nature's A Hoot, the brand new wildlife podcast brought to you by the Hawk Conservancy Trust. We're very excited to finally be live with this new project, and we can't wait to get stuck into all the different topics we've got planned, covering wildlife-based topics from every angle, from discussions about conservation and research projects, to understanding the little ways we can all help the wildlife that's close to home. We hope that our podcast will be a new way for us to inspire people about the natural world, and get as many people as possible outdoors appreciating the nature in their local area. We'll be talking about our conservation and research work at the Hawk Conservancy Trust, so you can find out more about the hard work we're doing to achieve our mission, the conservation of birds of prey. It won't just be all about us though, we'll be discussing other conservation projects too, beyond our own organisation, including the worrying uncertainty that so many species face in our modern world as well as including some of those feel-good success stories when all of that hard work finally pays off. As part of every episode, we'll make sure we provide you with easy ways to help the wildlife in your local area and the resources you need to find out more about conservation and how to live a more sustainable and wildlife-friendly lifestyle. Anyway, I think probably what we should do for our listeners at home is to kind of give them an opportunity to know who we are, first and foremost. Um, So, Hannah, who are you? (laughs) Well, you're correct. I am Hannah. Um, My job is the Conservation and Research Liaison. So I am in the Conservation Research team. um, And as the name implies, I am a liaison role Um, But it's quite a lot more than that. It's quite a mixed bag, my job role. Um, I do a lot of science communication, so I'm responsible for communicating our conservation and research work to the wider public. And this also involves working as a liaison between the conservation and research department and the bird team to make sure all the information they're giving out to the public is effectively communicated. Um, A very big part of my role is fundraising, especially at this time, very important given the income lost during COVID-19. So I'll do a lot of grant writing. I've just submitted a big grant proposal, fingers crossed. Um, uh, Also raising funds through events. And then sort of the last big part of my role is working on different research projects. So the on-site research is basically looking at different ways we can work with our birds on site to help conservation projects in the wild so it might be for example um, trying different backpacks on our harris hawks to see how it affects their flying ability so that this can then be applied to birds in the wild who might want to be fitted with tracking units so tom do you want to introduce yourself i think i probably ought to hadn't i um yeah hello i'm tom And um, I, a bit like Hannah, really, I have quite a diverse role, which is lovely. Um, Half of my role is as a member of the bird team. So I'm one of the lucky people that uh, gets to work with and and fly the birds in our demonstrations, on our experiences, and uh, and build up that that lovely rapport um, that that all of us on the bird team crave, really, with, with, with the birds themselves. So anything from eagles and vultures to owls, falcons, hawks, buzzards, you name it really, we, we get an opportunity to, to work with them. So I'm very, very lucky in that respect. Um, and then the other side of my job is uh, as a fundraising events manager. And uh, what that sort of means is that when we have events at the Trust, be that some of our Owls by Moonlight sessions where uh, we're flying some of the owls in the dead of night, uh, or whether it's our big event of the year where we often work with lots of other organisations who come in and Um, provide parts of our displays we've had um, the red devils come in and do a parachute jump into our meadow Uh, so it's all about the the organization of that side of things and with the ultimate goal really of raising funds to to support our mission and to support the work that um, you guys are also doing in the conservation and research department and it's nice we have that sort of crossover so we work together quite a lot on some projects Uh, like we have the 
especially the events like IVAD, International Vulture Awareness Day. So we also did something called uh, Biodiversity Breakfast last year. We wanted to give people the opportunity to come into the park kind of out of hours really before anybody else was up and uh, we'd set a moth trap the night before um which I, we got quite a few moths that day didn't we yeah there were there's quite a lot of species i can't remember the exact number but there were definitely a lot of species the um the meadow and well the trust in general because it's got a lot of different habitat types i think is a really great place for moths um we've all we always get a really good um turn up of moth species in the moth trap um, and we have two very dedicated volunteers who will trawl through their books afterwards to make sure we identify all the species. We got a lot of moth species and then we we also did a walk around, didn't we, with people to sort of help them learn different bird songs and identifying birds they might see around their local area. Yeah, and we obviously worked with, well, someone who you work very closely with, but I've spent a bit of time with uh, Matt, Dr Matt Stevens, who... Uh, is our UK conservation biologist, which I think is like the coolest <laughs> job title you can imagine, really. Um, and uh, he's just incredible at just, just picking out those calls, isn't he? Because we tried to do everything by identifying calls rather than what we could see, um, largely because a lot of the trust is, is fairly wooded now. Um, and that meant that seeing the birds was quite tricky, but listening to them um was fairly easy but but actually trying to identify them just from the cause was well anything but easy really <laughs> yes oh matt lake makes it look easy um because he's such an expert um but yeah definitely a tricky one it's one of those things i think you if you're so passionate about birds that you're it's one of those things you need to be doing it all the time you need to be going out every day and um, observing birds and listening to birds all the time and in different scenarios and that way you sort of get your ear in and you listen and he's just so good at identifying bird song I don't know how he does it so I guess this is probably a good opportunity for us to maybe get to know each other a little bit more because we work together and, and ordinarily we're sat on like pretty much adjoining desks but right now we're, we're doing all of this online because we have to we can't be that close yeah it's dead weird um <laughs> but um uh, hopefully it's an opportunity for us to get to know each other and also for uh, for our audience to get to know us as well. Um, so it's only fair that before we jump into talking about all that we want to talk about during this episode and uh, during following episodes that we kind of introduce ourselves properly. And so we're going to take this episode as an opportunity to give you an insight into who we are and really why we do what we do. Um, so Hannah, I kind of prepped a few questions. If you don't mind, uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of them and um, no kind of problem. see where that takes us. Um, so what would you say is your best wildlife experience? Well, that is the question. Um, I'm really lucky. I have spent quite a few years working in South Africa um, and Tanzania. Not to... Um, downplay the wildlife in this country i have had some amazing wildlife experiences in the uk um but just to sort of try and give you some highlights um when i was in tanzania i spent quite a lot of time with elephants and honestly there's nothing like it it's just incredible this huge animal that is so intelligent and there's so much that we don't know about them um, I think elephant, if you, if I was going to say a species, I think elephants would be right up there. Um, also in Tanzania, I have spent a bit of time a along the coast um, and I was really, really lucky enough to um, swim with whale sharks. So I've always been quite fascinated by the marine world, um, whales and dolphins and sharks as well, although they terrify me. Um, irrationally obviously it always, always makes me quite sad how badly and how negatively they can be portrayed in the media but I do still have a completely irrational fear of them um, but, like how many films are there that oh, is like so bad. I mean I know Jaws is the is the classic one but how many films come out and it's like oh somebody's stuck at a ca in a cage at the bottom of the <laughs> yes. ocean the air's running out and the big baddie of it is, is this great shark. white shark, you know, yeah. and that, I, like you, I feel a bit sorry for them, really. I do as well, because they're fascinating animals. I do find them terrifying, but I think that that's a natural sort of 
instinct, a healthy respect, exactly. Um, but obviously, I would absolutely love to see a great white in the wild. Maybe not in the water, but <laughs> from a boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, whale sharks, obviously, a completely different ball game because they eat plankton. Um, and swimming with them was just incredible. They're absolutely colossal. And I was just in complete awe. And they look like, as they're swimming, they just look like it's so effortless. And so you swim along the top of the water with a snorkel on above them. And as soon as one comes along, the guy on the boat is like, get in, get in, get in. You've got to get in and see them. And, and you're like, oh, okay, okay. So you jump in and you think, okay, I've got a bit of time. It's still there. And within a few seconds of a couple of tail beats, they're gone into the abyss. This ginormous animal that is just beyond comprehension that sounds amazing and the elephants thing um i totally get that i mean obviously kind of growing up we see elephants in 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 zoological institutions but um i mean i was lucky enough to go to africa uh, with the trust on on one of the vulture projects that we do yeah. um in in south africa and and as a part of that we got a chance to go out and see some of the the other wildlife that was there and um, you're totally right. They have a presence about them. And it's not just about their size. There's something... No, they're just incredible. They're so intelligent. Yeah. And you can you can see that. And and I think people often report it as, as kind of being scientifically true. And you might like put your foot down on this and say, because you're a scientist, <laughs> so you'll go, no, this has not been proven. But that kind of um, emotional intelligence as well... Um, that kind of obviously they're they're part of a herd, which which makes a big difference to their kind of social links. Um, but I almost kind of felt like you could feel that that kind of bond that they had with each other. Yeah, they're so intelligent. You're right, and the individuality as well. They have um, personalities, and if you spend time with individuals, you get you really get to know them. So not in Tanzania, but when I worked in um, South Africa. The first time, so 22, went over to South Africa to work on a small game reserve that was doing uh, research into the carnivores. So they had, um, it's, a fenced re- it's a fenced reserve, but they had a few lions and some cheetah and some wild dogs. And the project they were doing was looking at how the um, smaller carnivores sort of moved in relation to the lions. And obviously they moved, the general con- sort of conclusion was that they moved to where the lions weren't because obviously you would wouldn't you if you're a cheetah you don't really want to be where the lions are um anyway but there were also some elephants on that reserve and so i spent a lot of time working on my own like solo working driving around the reserve on my own which i absolutely loved um and there was one particular um male elephant called bfe which stood for big friendly elephant um and he he was such a character and he knew he knew the different vehicles he knew people's voices he knew like the smell of who was in the car like he would know if it was me on my own or if it was me and my colleague or if it was a game drive vehicle he didn't like game drive vehicles because they would get too close to him um yeah and so I remember one particular experience where I was driving on my own and you and I saw him up ahead and I was like oh god he's definitely got like gonna push his luck with me (laughs) and he's quite a big elephant and he just stood in the road and I thought okay I'll I'll approach to a safe distance and then just let him walk around me Um, and obviously just didn't want to get out of the way and so I thought okay so I'll pull off the road and then he can walk along the road no (laughs) so he just wanted to just come right to the car and he did and he came and he walked right past the car and he as he walked past he just looks at me like side side eye looked at me as he was walking past and honestly your heart is just thumping and yeah incredible experience he wasn't aggressive in any way I wouldn't have approached him if I thought that he was going to be aggressive but yeah I mean just incredibly massive and just he he knew who was boss and he just you know he would take advantage of that i think <laughs> so so hannah survival with an elephant because like some animals you're supposed to run and some animals you're supposed to stand your ground what what do you do with an elephant you're supposed to stand your ground but it really really depends on the situation and i've been in more situations not where i was the decision maker 
where the we've just exited <laughs> so you have to assess the situation as it happens and especially in Tanzania where I used to work um the elephants there were uh, of a population that um had suffered quite a lot of poaching and that it affects them emotionally and their behavior so you have to be more careful because they're more likely to be aggressive because they're very scared of people basically and is it true in some parts of um some parts of africa now that where there's been high levels of poaching of elephants for their tusks that we're now seeing less and less elephants developing tusks because of that yeah so i i'm not sure of the exact science on this but in my observation and through people that i've spoken to who work um researching elephants for example in uh the national park i worked in the elephants there the females are less of them have tusks wow so we might you know even if we manage to sort of reduce the the level of persecution that this species is facing they might be changed going forwards because because of the actions we're taking yeah i mean i think they are yeah i mean it's not completely infeasible at all unfeasible I've got a few questions for you as well, Tom. Good. So we, I, I'm going <laughs> to ask you some questions too. Yeah. So it's not just me rambling on the whole time. <laughs> no, please do because you've probably <laughs> trumped me now because you've said your two best Literally wildlife experience. Oh and... yeah, I didn't. You know, I didn't even realise that. <laughs> but you've picked a whale shark swimming with a whale shark. Sorry. And working with elephants on a game reserve in Tanzania. Like, okay, where do we go from here? <laughs> I know I'm very very lucky I don't I I don't ever deny how amazing those experiences are you know it's great I'm really lucky um but yeah so what's so tell me about your um sort of earliest memory of seeing wild animals or what sort of was your inspiration when you were younger I I I, well I suppose my inspiration for looking at wildlife in the first place because I was very aware that 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 wasn't particularly cool to be looking at animals and and be interested in wildlife and things but it was kind of wildlife I was something I always go back to and um, it was well kind of my grandparents because I I spent a lot of time with my grandparents when I was younger and uh, we used to go out on walks in the countryside on a on a Saturday afternoon and we'd take a picnic and uh, my grandfather my pap especially he was very keen on birds of prey and he always kind of had been um so we'd spot things like kestrels on the side of the road we would see buzzards um in those days we still weren't really seeing kites i didn't see a kite until i was about 15 or 16 and that was when we were kind of driving down the m40 and suddenly oh, there's a red kite and now they're kind of we see them every single day and if if people have visited the trust listening to this you'll know they come over in our display every single day i also remember kind of digging around in the dirt in the garden and finding snails and then again probably not the thing i should be doing in should have been doing in hindsight but um i used to put them in at, you know at christmas you'd get the big tubs of roses or quality street and we'd keep them because you know mum would think oh we'll you know we'll put something in that or if we make fairy cakes or something we can put them in that and uh, because we kept those I would take them and then go and pick snails out the garden pull up big tufts of grass and then in in my mind I then had a new pet so I had yeah but they like bless them uh, it was not the ideal habitat for them the ideal habitat was where they were in the garden but I was like no I want it inside and so uh, but I'd always get up the next morning and I would open the, the tub and there wouldn't be any snails in there so I have a sneaky suspicion that my mum bless her was like we're not having snails in the house so I think she was probably their saviour in the end and put them back out in the garden um. yeah I, I did very similar things I, I used to put things in pots and ha- put them in little jars so I could look at them. And I had a big old fish tank in the garden that I just filled with, yeah, like you said, like tufts of grass and dirt and worms <laughs> and all sorts. If I'd find a beetle or something, I'd put that in there. Obviously, it would just fly out again. But, you know, I think it's just if you're, you're, you've are you you got that sort of curiosity, you want to put things in something so you can look at it. <laughs> So Hannah, when did you first know that you were interested in 
animals or wildlife when did you when did that kind of get you I think very similar to you I had experiences when I was younger we used to go on holiday um to Wales to stay in a little cottage in sort of in the hills in the middle of nowhere in Wales and like you we used to, we used to see red kites on the way and this was probably when I was maybe eight or nine probably younger as well and if you saw a red kite my dad would get so excited about the red kites and be pointing out the red kites to us and that was the only time we would see them when I was that young like you said and obviously now they're um so much more common in our area at least um but yeah also there one one thing I remember is there was a badger set close to the cottage that we used to stay in and I think badgers to me were like this sort of um ghostly almost sort of not real type of animal that you know I was never gonna see because it was out at night time and it was almost sort of this mystical animal that you you wouldn't be able to see but you just you knew it was there and it was really exciting just to see the set and so dad said to me well do you want to go and see if we can see them and I was so excited about it because first of all I was allowed up late because we had to go out at night time but second of all that I might the prospect of possibly seeing a badger was just amazing and we walked across this field and we just glanced one just for a few seconds it was going up the side of the field and it was sort of dusk so you could just about still see it and it turned towards us and you could see that distinctive striped face and we didn't see it again we saw it for a split second but it was just amazing and it was so nice to also have that experience with my dad you know because he was also really excited about it not that he would admit that now (laughs) Um, (laughs) that sounds really really special i have to say i still have to my knowledge i've still never seen a badger in the wild i haven't and we've got sets really close to the house and i know there are badgers there because my camera trap has seen them yeah and i've so i've seen the evidence but i have never seen one for myself i mean i can probably count on on two hands just less than maybe even one hand how many times i've seen one in the world not very many but yeah so i get what you mean about them being this mystical animal you do have to you do really go have to go and look for them i think i sh- I, sh- I should probably stay up later than i do i yeah, feel you should get out there yes <laughs> stay past your bedtime and then you can go out and find the badger <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything is there anything you have haven't seen in the wild that you would really like to see or what's would be a big tick on the bucket list absolutely yeah i mean it never ends does it because no, you're, mine never, doesn't. you're never going to see everything you want to see but i mean i guess in terms of raptors um i'd really like to see a bearded vulture in the wild i'd love to and yeah. that kind of became tantalizingly close over the last few weeks because there was one spotted in in the uk and i can't remember where it was but <laughs> On, like the occasional really? visitor comes over from mainland Europe and they, they do okay. appear from time to time, nowhere near us, sadly, down in, in Hampshire. Um, but yeah, I'd love to see a, a bearded vulture. And in terms of other animals, I don't really know very much about um, sort of a lot of marine life and, and whales and sharks, a bit like you were saying with the whale sharks. It's a totally different world underwater, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I guess things like orcas and uh, and dolphins i just I, i've had so little experience ar- around kind of cetaceans and and um, marine animals as well that um anything like that would be really exciting um what about you have you got like bucket list animals whale yeah whales orcas would be incredible i can't imagine seeing them in the wild that would be amazing i would love to see a tiger in the wild i was obsessed with tigers when i was a kid um so that's probably the top one or or snow leopard as well mm. that would be amazing that one's quite tricky it's both of those yeah, quite tricky yeah. but um not not a big ask no no <laughs> just just something small yeah easy <laughs> well fingers crossed for you on your bucket list animals <laughs> yeah So, Tom, how is your wildlife garden coming along? I've heard that you've got a, an amazing pond and all sorts in your back garden. Yeah, well, I, it's a little bit tricky because um, our house is rented 
So there's the things that I've done for wildlife in the garden kind of need to be ready to be moved out at any point that I would I would would leave. Um, oh no! Or they sort of oik me out, which hopefully won't happen at any point. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I have put a pond in there, but it's kind of it. It's just like a plastic pond that we've kind of sunk yeah. into one of the beds, um, and we've got. Um, plants for pollinators we've we sowed some wildflower seeds over on one side of the garden um and we'd left a, a little wild patch over in the corner as well just to try and encourage things and i think we definitely have seen uh, more bees and more butterflies coming to use the garden which is fantastic that's nice we, do, well, we get bats which is really cool i um i bought myself a bat detector earlier in the year and that was really fun learning how to oh, use nice. that and uh, and kind of getting to grips with the species that are around here so um, can you identify the species now yeah well sound? pipistrelles are like you know they're they're they are so common around here that's yeah. pretty much what you're gonna gonna hear all the time um but we've yeah. got long-eared bats as well um and i think those are the two that we we kind of hear most often on the on the bat detector um but they come so close to you i don't if you've been out bat detecting yeah, I've done it a few times. Yeah. I've, I've worked with a friend. I've got a couple of friends who are bat ecologists, one who is particularly obsessed with bats, and I've been out with her quite a few times. It's really good fun. It's nice. Yeah, they do come really close. They fly. feel like they're flying right over your head. You think you're <laughs> going to have to duck. I mean, obviously, they're, they're very <laughs> accomplished flyers, and you don't need to, but they come so close. And so we get those on the, the footpath just behind our house, and but also in the garden as well. And I'm kind of hoping that the fact we've put the pond in and we get a few yeah. uh, hatching, flying insects coming out of there is going to help that as well. And it has helped them kind of throughout the spring. But yeah, it's coming along nicely. And uh, oh, that's I'm, nice. I'm, I'm kind of pleased with it. We had, we had a frog in the pond this year as well. Wow. The, the pond, to give you an idea, the pond is about the length of two A4 pieces of paper and about the okay. width of the length of an A4 sheet of paper. So it's quite small. So the frog. So it's quite an accomplishment then, if you've got a frog in there. Yeah, I mean, I think he was That's just great. using it for a bit of a pit stop to kind of move on to <laughs> to somebody else's bigger pond because some people have got much bigger gardens around here, so they've probably got somewhere more attractive. But I was quite happy to be, you know, just a a B and B overnight to a frog. Okay, so now you know who we are. We'd like to introduce you to a couple of the regular features we'll be coming back to every episode. We want the programme to help us develop a rounded view of the natural world and what's going on in the fight to save some of the most incredible species on the planet. So our first feature is um, sort of the big story. Um, and I've been looking at a few different um, articles on this and the first one I sort of came across was about urban nature and how important urban nature is. And I think this links really nicely to um, the COVID-19 situation as well, where I'm sure people have seen videos of the wild boars turning up in Barcelona, I think it was, and sika deers wandering around on the streets or in the metro in Japan. Um, biodiversity is being lost, and unfortunately, at an alarming rate at the moment. So it's ever more important that we have um, urban nature and uh, cities can be some of the most biodiverse places in the world. For example, Cape Town. Um, Cape Town is home to 50% of South Africa's critically endangered vegetation types. Um, cities are really important for connectivity. They can provide havens for for species with the added bonus that it is proven to be great for your well-being to experience nature so it's also brilliant for us as well to advocate for urban nature and to protect urban nature so i heard these stories as well about um sort of creatures that are not normally seen in certain spaces suddenly when we had lockdown there was less people on the roads there's less people out and about going to the shops etc um that suddenly we're kind of turning up and and I kind of wondered to myself, are those animals kind of normally there? Maybe not at that time, but has there actually been more wildlife around because of lockdown? 
or are people just seeing it more because they're spending more time outdoors they're spending more time looking out their windows you know I kind of wonder whether there is more or we're just seeing it more well Tom I'm going to pull the scientist card here (laughs) please do (laughs) because (laughs) we don't I mean we don't really know because one of the restrictions of the lockdown unfortunately was that we couldn't really get out and do any data collection um, so field work wasn't really possible. So we don't really know. So a lot of it is observational sort of anecdotal data from here and there. And obviously it is wonderful to see nature coming back into places, particularly into cities. And I think the most important thing that has come out of it really is that people ha- have maybe come around to appreciate nature more. So when we have kind of this increased biodiversity in our cities, does that necessarily mean that we are going to be healthier because I'm reading some articles and again you might pull the scientist card on this and I'm sure you will um, could having more animals pose more of a threat in terms of bringing disease in uh, or having that diversity might help to keep numbers of animals that carry those diseases down so is that biodiversity always a positive thing? Um, I think biodiversity is nearly always a positive thing I can't think of a situation when it wouldn't be high biodiversity wouldn't be a positive thing um disease ecology is massively complex as we know from working with vultures um but yes in some cases higher biodiversity can protect us um from exposure to zoonotic pathogens or zoonotic diseases so i had a little look around a bit did a bit of research and a good example of this is lyme disease in some places in the u.s So the vector species, which is the species that actually carries Lyme disease and spreads it, is a tick. And this tick has what we call reservoirs. And the reservoirs are the animals that the tick generally lives on. Um, Its primary reservoirs are a few species of small mammal like shrews and mice. Um, So these are the ones that they will usually hang on to. There are only a few of these species And they are all quite resilient and they all do quite well in degraded habitats or in habitats that are highly impacted by humans. So they can then dominate in low diversity communities, which then increases the exposure, can increase the exposure of humans to Lyme disease. They do, these species do also exist in less degraded habitats, which have a higher diversity So the less degraded habitats that aren't impacted so much by humans will also have those same species, but they'll have lots of other species as well, which aren't necessarily a good vector for that tick. So it means that there's less disease transmission. So that's a good example of in the higher diversity community, there is less, you're less likely for the disease to spread than in the lower diversity community. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, So then I guess the question I would ask about the kind of COVID-19 situation, the whole lockdown, has COVID-19 actually been a positive thing for wildlife? Well, there's very many different sides to this. Um, An example to draw on might be the wildlife trade. Um, In terms of, for example... China, at some point in February, um, banned eating and selling wild animals because we think we're not, it's not completely concluded, but we think that coronavirus came from a wildlife market. Um, So to fight the spread of coronavirus, they banned eating and selling wild animals, which obviously, in the long term, if that is something that becomes permanent, is positive for wild animals. But that's not taking into account illegal wildlife trade, um, which is still going to be a huge problem. Um, Another report, which was sort of not conflicting, but shows another side to the story, um, is that because of COVID-19, in some places in Africa, the example was in Kenya, and also some places in Southeast Asia, the situation with COVID-19 has increased poaching. Um, Now, this is subsistence poaching, like I was talking about earlier, not so much on the um, poaching of elephants or rhinos for ivory or their tusks. So subsistence poaching is 
just poaching for to put food on the table but this has increased in some areas because of the impact that COVID-19 has had on the tourism industry so especially in Africa where a lot of people rely on the tourism industry rely on the safari industry for jobs they might have lost their jobs and then they've then seen an impact with an increase in bushmeat poaching so as I said there's two sort of sides to that where it has had some positive impacts but there has also been some negative impacts unfortunately. So now it's time for our top tip to give wildlife a helping hand. This month, just add water. Adding a little water to your garden can be a real helping hand to the wildlife there. In fact, it's one of the best ways to attract new wildlife to your garden. Over the last 100 years, the UK countryside is reported to have lost almost 70% of its natural ponds, according to the Royal Horticultural Society. Adding that all-important water to your garden couldn't be simpler. Find yourself a watertight container, big or small will work, and why not try something that would otherwise be thrown away? Reuse and recycle wherever you can. Pop your container somewhere shaded in the garden and fill with water. Rainwater is best for the wildlife to thrive. Leave your new pond to settle for a week or two before adding native species of pond plants. Place native plants, stones and old logs around the edge of the pond to create extra habitats for mini-beasts. Be sure to provide a way of escape for any creatures that may fall into the pond. A log or plank of wood is perfect. Consider a shallow area or an extra dish of water with pebbles above the water level for bees, butterflies and other insects to safely take a drink. Finally, sit back, watch and wait for the wildlife to find the new perfect habitat you've made. So thank you so much for joining us for our first episode. It's been really fun. It really has. Um, so remember, you can see more information about what we've been discussing on our social media. We'll post up uh, some of the links of um, some of the research that we've done. Um, along with lots of other updates from the Trust, as always. Um, if you're going to find us on social media, we are at Hawk Conservancy on Instagram and Twitter. And if you can just search Hawk Conservancy Trust on Facebook and YouTube. And we do have lots of videos on YouTube as well. You could even share with us what you're doing as well to help your local wildlife. Make sure you click to subscribe to this podcast too through your podcast provider so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Like next month, we'll be taking the leap into the amazing world of British owls, chatting all about the work that we do at the Trust to protect them. Once again, thanks for joining us. It's been great and we look forward to welcoming you back on the 1st of September. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye.